It's Wednesday, June 14th, 2017. It's time for Worth Point Chats with Harry Rinker. I'm Greg Watkins, the editor at worthpoint.com, and it's time to talk with our expert on all things collectibles and antiques, Harry Rinker. Harry, how are you? Well, I'm doing fine. I'm, I'm in the midst of a big project, as you, as you are aware. Um, Will Seipel, uh, who is the head of Worth Point, has decided to add historic introductions to up on Worth Point. Uh, right, right. Following, following really kind of a, what I used to call the Worman format style approach, which we had when I, I edited the Worman's books, where you have a little bit of history about the company, then what are some of the key things to look for, and then uh, what are the marks that are out there, and then finally what reference books are out there. In part, it's to call attention to the to the reference books at uh, oops, sorry about that. We will like, totally ignore my phone. <laughs> it's all right. Anyway, anyway uh, so uh, it, it is one of those things where uh, I'm doing it again. And, you know, I've done it before. Uh, and, and when I sold uh, the rights to Rinker Enterprises Library and References to Will, I sold the copyrights that were in Rinker Enterprises' name. I didn't sell the copyrights in my name's to Will. So a lot of the information that he wants is already readily available to him. However, I just I was just glancing when we began the show, the, my last Rinker on Collectibles Price Guide, which was written in 2000. Well, you know what? It's 2017. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the fun thing for me is that, you know, we, we went to a lot of trouble to keep the histories of companies updated and so forth, but a lot has happened. In 17 the years is a long time including the glass industry right now you know there were all these kind of you know ohio ohio is this, one of the centers for the glass industry with heisey and newark and and a number of cambridge and so forth up in up up, up in those areas and and there was a, a a company that did kind of glass animal figures they were all the hoop de doop de rage in the 1990s and early part of the 20th century and there were a number of companies that did them, did them uh, Crystal Art Class, and Crystal Art Class, which is Dagenhardt and Moser. And, you know, when I put the 2000 edition to bed, why the simple truth of the matter was that, uh, was that the, uh, those companies were all in business. Well, except for Moser, the other two are gone. But the tragedy, and this, this, this is where it just, bothers me sometimes. The, the Dagenhart Glass Company, there was a Dagenhart Glass Museum, which in Cambridge, Ohio, which everybody thought was about Dagenhart Glass, but it was really Mrs. Dagenhart's glass collection. And that glass collection started in the 19th century and ran all the way through the 20th century. And not just the glass that, she, that Dagenhart made, but all kinds of glass. It's an exhibit that there was an entire room filled with grass repros, where you had the period piece of glass with the repro stuff. It was the best repro exhibit I ever saw in glass. And I had the privilege of visiting the museum a couple of times, I'm pleased to say. Well, well man, if you're ever in Cambridge Museum, you gotta go see the Dagon Art Museum. No, you don't, because guess what? It's gone. It's gone, and, and you know, somehow, I didn't follow it again, I don't know why, and you know, I wonder what happened to all that stuff. Well, apparently, the West Virginia there's a, a Wheeling Museum of Glass in Wheeling, West Virginia. They got some of it, but not all of it. And I kept thinking, what a wonderful place this was. And I guess it just ran out of money. I guess either she didn't leave enough to finance it and keep it going, or the local people didn't want to keep it going, or whatever. Right. And. Over the course of my career, I've watched a lot of great museums, especially toy museums, collapse because they were largely single owner collections. And when a single owner died and the heirs didn't want to keep the museum going, down they went. Yeah. And this is, this, this is one of the problems, too, if you left something to that museum because you thought, well, you know, I'm going to enhance their collection and what have you. Uh, it's, it's, it's a real problem with, with the length of time museums last. Well, I historical. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say that one of the, the best examples I can think of is the Roy Rogers Museum. Uh -huh, yes. 
they 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 couldn't keep it open. They couldn't afford it, and then they couldn't give any. Nobody would take it, so they well, ended they, up having to sell it all. Well, yes, and, and Trigger bought a good price. Uh, yeah, it was one hundred seventy thousand like that. But no, but but that's yes, that's a great example. The Roy Rogers Museum was uh, up in California for a long while. To Branson, Missouri, hoping to take advantage of the Branson crowd. But the problem is the people that knew and cared about Roy Rogers kept getting older and older and older. And nobody that comes to Branson these days gives a hoot about Roy Rogers. It's no. They were going to build a big hoppy museum in Wichita, Kansas, and, and it never happened either. I mean, it came pretty close. There was going to be a hoppy theme park. Really? Uh, yeah, a whole hoppy theme park. Now, and it when, got, when was this you talked about? Was this in the 90s that they were talking about this? or? This was, no, this was in the 2000s. Oh, really? No, no, wait a minute. Yes, it was in the early 2000s because uh, uh, it was there. Now, the interesting thing was, you're going to love this one, a little Bill Boy trivia, as they say. Hoppy actually had a, 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 an amusement park in the 50s in California. He was the he, he beat Disney. Yeah. Oh, not oh, not Knoxbury Farm. That was already there. But he had his own park for a couple of years. Uh, and then it, it 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 went bust. But the point of the matter, I, I don't know how did I get sidetracked on this. Oh, it's about the glass. glass. I've been doing I've glass. been doing introductions, and, and I've just been a stuff about that had still survived in two thousand when I did my book. They're almost all gone. Are there, are there are there are there producing glass to stuff olives in it or something you know commercial glass as opposed to pattern pattern glass and, and what have you and it just it just goes to show the whole general decline of the use of glass or I mean what do you I mean do you, do you drink you, you still drink out of glasses right I you do don't yeah no I I've got one right here yeah there you go but now you, but you, but look at ordinary piece of schlock glass it's a round cube with a bottom. Right? No pattern yeah, well, to this, it. This, no, this no is shape, but yeah. Made it. It's nothing it's nothing uh collectible, that's for yeah. sure. Walmart or K Bar class. Um eBay. eBay glass. Even eBay cheaper, glass. yeah. <laughs> that's right. Well, so it, it it was quite a phenomenon. But anyway, now did we talk last week about my new project? about uh, I'm, I want to get people to send in uh, comments about what do they own that their grandchildren don't want. Did I tell you That's about right. that? Yes. yes, we did talk about that. Well, I'm going to talk about it again because I didn't get any responses this week. Uh, no, <laughs> look, for all the people that are watching this video, you, you all know I do a weekly column called Rinker on Collectibles. You can read it on my website, harryrinker.com. You can read it on worthpoint.com too because you post it up on, on your site as well. But I want to. I really want to do a column about what grandkids don't want. Now, it, it, you say make a list, Harry. I mean, I I, I made a list and, and, and either, but I want to do the top ten. And you know, and, and okay, let's admit it. I already got one letter about Grandma's china. Right. Okay. But I'd like to know what other people are finding out out there. What what do they have? The grand, that the grandchildren or the children don't want. And I'll and, and tell you why I'm asking this. Because I'm not necessarily looking for things that that came from the grandparents or whatever. I'm looking for the things that parents acquired. The parents are now in their 60s and 70s. And their kids say, I don't care whether I grew up with that or not. I don't want it. Okay? Right. And and uh, I know there's a lot of, I mean, look, look what happened to Fiesta Wear. Well, you remember when Fiesta Wear was hotter than heck. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then they brought out that modern repro thing, which which killed, or modern colors, I'm not going to say repros, but modern colors, which kind of killed the collecting market. But the point is that nobody's finding Fiesta sets in grandma's closet anymore once the fell out. Right. Because all the people who own Fiesta sets are dead. That use them on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, of older people around, but the truth of the matter is that there's no young people around using them anymore because they're not dishwashers. The new stuff is, but not the old stuff. Right. right? 
the new stuff, you, you, you know, it's, 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 it's Crate and Barrel Fest. And my two favorite places, Pottery Barn and Crate and Barrel, may they ride in you know where. Uh, <laughs> well, look, I mean, let's face the inevitable. Okay, now let, we can, we, you and I can joke about this all we want. But ultimately, in writing these intros, for worth what I'm going to have to write a Crate and Barrel and a Pottery Barn intro. I guess you would because well, because that crap is being sold on on eBay. Yeah, as as and antique. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you don't have a toilet you flush with a dot when the data comes in and get rid of some of that stuff, do you? No. Well, um, the stuff you mean for the for the Worthopedia? Yeah. We're able to. Is that a date limit? No, it's it's uh, by category. So so we should not be getting a lot of that crate and barrel stuff. Yeah, but I'll have to, I'll have to talk it, with our, our data folks and find out exactly what they do yeah. to. Oh, um, come on, you go to you go to crate and barrel or or, or pottery barn and, and and there is dinnerware and stem and and and, and, and uh, bugs and you know. That would fit in any one of the eBay collecting categories. I mean, it's not like like Crate and Barrel and Pottery Barn are eBay category less. True. Right. Right. True. I'll, I'll have to check on that with our data guys and find out. Well, well, I well I can tell you this much. Uh, I I it's been fun for me writing these intros because I have to go into the mark section and the pattern section, and I have to go into the. Uh, to the library, and I have to go into the Wikipedia all the time to find examples for the articles to illustrate some of the points that I'm making in each of the intros. And I, I again, there's a ton of stuff up there. What I really would like to get is a button to flush some of it out of the system. But you know, hey, that's the whole point of the Wikipedia is it just piles up there, and you have a huge database. Speaking of databases, as we say, don't you like the way I segue into this? Uh, very, that very smooth. That that was like glass. That that, that yeah. I was wondering how I could avoid this, and I've been avoiding it for months. But we got a question in about a clock, right? Yeah, we do. Hello, Greg. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. We. Yes. Good. You got a. We got a question about the clock, right? Right. And here's the clock, and this this is, you know, kind of an interesting clock. It's it's key wound, right? It's not electric, if I remember rightly. Right. You know, looks like it's from about the 1920s, 1930s. In front of it. Now, Caldwell and Company was not a manufacturer of clocks. Caldwell and Company was a jeweler uh, that sold clocks. Other People made them for them and put the Caldwell uh, and Company logo on it. I should say Philadelphia, does it? Yeah, it does. It says Philadelphia. And this, is, this is Westminster Chimes, eight bells, and so forth. Uh, okay. And 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 you uh, went to Worth Point and you looked up uh, Caldwell and Company, right? And found a whole bunch of clocks. There were uh, 161 items right. in, through all categories, yes. Yeah. But unfortunately, you didn't find too many that look like that our listeners sent in, right? Right. There were not too many of those big cased mantel clocks. Here, here's no, one that's. You didn't find any of them, right? Nothing that looks similar, no. Yeah, okay. Now, yeah, why here's... not? You're anyway, okay, there's one. Westminster, where was that one? Oh, go back. West, Westminster bracket clock. Right. This is that says Winter Halder and Hoffmeyer bracket yeah, clock retailed by E. J. Caldwell. He bought three fifty six, three hundred and fifty six dollars and fifty five cents in two thousand fourteen. And clocks aren't going up in value; they're going down in value. But the point, of the matter is, that two things helped make it. One was the Westminster Chimes, and the other one is the Caldwell name because. The young in the in the brand name business. All right. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to try some experiments here. 
Many times people say, well, I didn't find an answer. But the answer is you only did one search. So let's let's search for Winchester Chime Mantle Clocks. Okay. Let me Forget to call here. Winchester. Was it, was it Winchester? I think that's what it said, right? Not Westchester. Winchester Chime Mantle Clocks. Let's go back and look. Westminster. Not Winchester. Westminster. I'm right. sorry, Westminster. Right. Westminster Chimes Mantle Clock. that pulls up now you can't the it says all categories you don't have clocks as a choice there do you well clocks show up under furniture okay so you can limit it to furniture and see if we can eliminate some of this stuff well all right we're not right. doing very so well with I've that got about a thousand uh so we've got 8,600 hits under Westminster Chimes Mantle Clock. Bracket. Bracket. Because none of those look like what we're looking for. All right, now they dropped it to 676. But now they're starting to look more like what we're looking for, right? They, yes, you're, you're right, they are. Notice, notice, notice they have like there and... What have you? Just keep going there. One with a fairly sophisticated set of chimes, chimes on it. So keep going down there. Don't don't give up on us here. No, we're not hitting any. We're not looking at any with all those silent chimes and the, that. New Panel no. clock was almost like the top of a tall case because that, that's the kind of sophisticated thing you find in the big tall cases. All right, so I changed so it I, from most recent to best match. Oh, yes. Okay, so. Right. We're doing a little better there. There's a, well, Let's go back up there. There's one. Let's go back up one row there. This one there, here? There's one, the third one in. Mantle, bracket clock, Westminster, Chinese. What did that sell for? Hundred and twenty two dollars. But look at this. And <laughs> there's your work. <laughs> it works. Well, I care about that. Well, it's it's plastic and battery operated. It's not even real clockwork in there. Oh, I see what you're saying. All right, well forget that. And the other one has is, is a wild one. It looked like it was. Well, all right. But fooling around, so how do we come up with a price? Well, this is a case where you really want to talk about it in two or three ways. In theory, the clock's worth 500 bucks. Okay, in theory. But that's, that's a you know, dealer price who doesn't really want to sell it price. In reality, oh, there's one. What did that one bring? There's got this a couple of tries. $203.50. Yes, yes. Uh, my my feeling is that he was looking at two seventy five to three hundred, maybe a little bit more, maybe three and a quarter, but not a lot more than that. Why? Because first of all, it's a beautiful clock, and I am not taking anything away from the fact that it's a beautiful clock. All right, let's let's be clear about that. The second thing is that it it's uh, it's market driven. Now we're going to assume it works. By the way, right? It's market driven, and what do we mean by market driven? Well, you're not going to sell sell that. What what, are they, what, what do they say about uh, oh, in, in Illinois, Peoria, right? Right. Yeah, well, well, they, it might sell in Peoria. They can't. Once. They can't sell in Peoria, but they can sell it in New York City. They can sell it in St. Louis. They can sell it maybe in Los Angeles, but they certainly can sell it in Dallas, Dallas and Fort Worth, and Houston, Texas because it's decorator driven okay and in those markets it's a 500 dollars clock could be even even more than that five six hundred if it's working uh, uh well but in the countryside it's a 200 dollar clock i mean this is this is a clock that needs to go into an urban large metropolitan market and one where there's a strong sense of history and tradition and 
and, and a bunch of old farts that go to country clubs. No, okay, enough of that. <laughs> uh, there you go, right? Right. Now, watch this next segue. Speaking of Texas, are you ready for this? Sure. I used to, oh, oh no, you want me to do this first. Okay, well, well but that was such a good segue, too. It anyway. Was, it was, yes, we can. We like, we'd, like people, we'd like people to submit objects to us. That would be nice. That is send information about your objects, size, markings, history, what history is, and some good JPEG photographs to community at worthpoint.com. That's community at worthpoint.com. Um, also, if you have a subject you'd like to uh, talk to me about, uh, that you'd like me to pontificate on, or whatever it is you'd like me to do to it, uh, we'd love to have you uh, drop us a note there as well. Now, I'm making this segment about Texas. My course, you tell in my courses, I always, what's my favorite phrase? If you can't sell it anywhere else in America, send it to Texas. Right. Because they got more money than sense. More money than sense. Try to stop disparaging Texas because I found a place even worse. Oh, okay. Send it to Los Angeles, particularly Beverly Hills. Really? Those people have so much money and so little taste that you could sell them anything. <laughs> and and so how pray tell may you ask, do I know that was this? what I was gonna ask. What what made you decide that the Los Angeles is yeah. the king what of schlock? The answer is heritage auctions at a sale in Los Angeles. Okay. Of quote contemporary modern and contemporary art. Okay. And what do you think they sold? Sneakers. I, I, I want to say vein, paintings. No, of no, I'm telling you, they sold sneakers, Greg. They did what? Now, you know, I wonder if we have to develop an, an, od an odometer, an odorometer for sneaker sales, where you put it in the shoe and get a whiff, that, and how that will impact value. But well, see, I know that sneakers are collectibles. They, there's a, a huge well, amount of people who collect sneakers. I've kept my mouth shut about these damn crappy Hermes tan bags, which I think are just asinine for the price people are paying for. Okay, seriously. I've said, all right, if people want to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for a stupid handbag, those movie stars and all those other idiots have the money, let them spend it. Okay. But I draw the yeah. line at sneakers. Now, and I can tell you sneakers are collectible because when we did the exhibit West Michigan Collects, remember that exhibit at the Grand Rapids Art Museum? There was an entire case filled with sneakers. sneakers That's right, I remember there was. Right. As an object of art. Well, in Beverly Hills, now I gotta say one thing. Heritage had enough good sense, A, not to hold this auction in Dallas Fort Worth where they're based. B, not to hold this auction in New York where people are incredibly stupid to, to in terms of what they spend their money on, South or in the Midwest. But they were smart enough to hold it in Beverly Hills. And so are you ready for this? The movie Back to the Future popularized Nike Air Mag self-lacing sneakers. Right, and Back to the Future 2. Right, which exist. Well, in 1916, Nike did some. 16. Now, now, do the math. That's like one year ago, right? Right. The record for a pair of sneakers less than one year old was 32,500. Some idiot. Idiot. I I idiots. Because they had to bid it up. $2,500 for a pair. Now, <laughs> Great, great. They have don't don't people have a sense of history here? Okay, that's what they're worth today, and no doubt the market is going to run, and some idiots are going to pay more than that at some point in the future. I hope the guy that paid that money sells them next week for more money. I just hope he does. Yeah, it's got to be quick because who knows? Got to be quick money? because in twenty five years from now, no one is going to give a hoot, and he isn't going to get 
couple th- you might get a couple thousand for. Them. Now, are these are these the actual shoes from the movie, or are these I, a? Um, no, they, oh, they're oh, heavy last they, year. No. no, these are Nike shoes. Nike did. Okay, okay. Uh, no, wait, I was trying to say a pair of 2001 Nike Air Mags, accompanied by their original box. Well, and the box raises the price by what, 30%? Is that what you say? Huh? The box increases the price by 30%? Well, it, it increased those to 2000 or 8125 bucks. I, I mean, you can't, I mean, these are, these are things you, you obviously don't wear. You just buy them as a speculator. Now, I don't know if Nike's limiting their production runs or not. I suspect they are. And so it must be hard to get them coming out new. And so the people that get them coming out new, they're lucky. Now throw them right at the auction and boom. I mean, the previous record was close to 20000 Now it's $55,000. for fit. I'm sorry. I don't want to over-exaggerate here. The, the record is... Five hundred. Oh, well, that's a bargain. It's not fifty-five. <laughs> you know, it's. I we don't attract younger people to the antiques and collectible trade. Well, first of all, what young people have this kind of money? The good news is they sold them in Beverly Hills, so all those kids on the street corner selling drugs probably have that kind of money in their back pocket. Okay, so uh, I'm sure we're going to get a nasty note about that remark, but nevertheless, the whole point of the matter is that it's crazy. It's, it makes no sense whatsoever. Raker's 30 years rule. For the first 30 years of anything's life, all its value is speculative. So you buy these things, you're speculating. There's a word, another word for them. They're high-end beanie babies. Mm. And we all know what happened the beanie baby market. Yes. During that period, I was known as the beanie meanie. I'm going to become the sneaker sneaky guy or something here. I am ready to go on any television show, radio show or whatever, and debate the merit of sneakers. Okay? Seriously. I mean, I, I, I mean... Remember when they collected Bakelite radios? You remember Bakelite radio collecting, right? Right, right, yes. And, that, and especially the modern ones. The, the, the modern Art Deco, right? yeah, right. The yeah, streamlined. The Deco. Modern, streamlined modern radios, yeah. right? Right. The, They're, the faded, they were cool looking. Faded, right? Yeah. Well, they're not cool anymore. That market's collapsed. They're not cool for that price anymore. I'd still like one. Well, okay, but maybe you want to start checking out the Wikipedia and see what things sell for. Yeah. Because you might find out that there's some bargains out there. But that's, that's the other interesting thing, too. In the old days when eBay was an auction site, when everything sold at auction, there were plenty of bargains. But now eBay is just another. It's like a big online antique shop, and the dealer's up there asking for top dollar. You're going to have to find a bargain somewhere else because they don't exist on eBay anymore. Unless somebody uh, is smart yeah. enough, it lets some, something yeah. fly through for at, at, at an auction value. Well, the, has, thing with, the thing with eBay is they'll put the price up, but they will take an offer. And if you offer them 30% off or whatever it is, then they may take it because. Or more. Or more. I mean, they're, they're looking for that one person who will pay full price, but if somebody offers 50% and they know that, you know, all right, here's here's cash in hand. Yeah, I'm yeah, gonna that's have to that. that. It's better than whatever, right? Exactly. So why not and price it high, hope that somebody takes a flyer on it, but know that if you'll take whatever offer is offered. I found, I found that, that all the times I did that, and again, the only price I care about is what I'm willing to pay. I simply email and say, look, this is what I'm willing to pay. I don't want to negotiate. If you don't want it, that's fine with me. Leave it up. Only once did the person not take my offer. Now, how many times did you, that, how many times you try this? Other than that, it, it happened all the time. Yeah. I mean, you know, 
people love bargains. I mean, that's what drove the antiques and collectibles trade for years. People were out bargain hunting. And the truth of the matter is that the way prices have fallen from their high, high point in the end of the 20th century and early part of the 21st century, the antiques and collectibles field is loaded with bargains. The problem is that, that we're not getting that information out. All we're getting out is information about $53,000 sneakers. Yeah. Well, and at the same time, is and it a this, bargain to get a, a set of uh, carnival glass at a great price if you don't want it? Well, that's the whole that's the whole problem. When you when you're talking about what are the value, things that cause value in something, condition is a, you talk about the big three. I always talk about the big three value factors, right? Yeah. Condition condition used to be number one, and, and to some extent, it's still important. Very very. Uh, the deal was that people today don't want to have to repair. I mean, they're not like me when I bought that music box and now I'm going to sink a couple, a couple, more than a couple of grand into it to fully restore it. And I don't really care because the missus wants it and I'm willing to do it. And because I, I'm a great believer in leave the campsite a better place than you found it kind of thing. Okay, so I, I will do that. But people want everything what we call room went ready. They want to go out to an antique mall, buy it, and put it right into place and not have to do anything to it, really. And they don't particularly want the age look either. They want it to look almost like it came off the assembly line. So from that point of view, scarcity, which because you know I won't use the word rare, is the second of the value add considerations. But what, there's nothing scarce anymore. I mean, almost everything we deal with is mass produced, okay? You know, okay, so they only made a couple of hundred of these sneaker pairs or however many they made. I don't really care. That's still mass production. I mean, people always say, Harry, what does limited mean? I said five is limited. Ten may be limited. Anything above ten is unlimited. Because when you when you make ten of something and it's limited, the ten buyers aren't going to destroy it. And value in the antiques and collectibles trade if there's to be scarcity, relies on people destroying more than get saved. And when everything gets saved and nothing gets destroyed, that's a whole other matter. Which brings me around to the third thing. And that today is the number one value added factor in the ethics of life. And that is, if nobody wants one, even though it may be 100 years old in near mint condition, it has no value because there's no buyers. And if you don't have a buyer, you don't have value. That's what you were talking about, right? Right. It's like a carnival glass set. You go, you go and see a carnival glass set, and there's 45 bucks on it. And you know that that was once a three to $700 carnival glass set. On it, it's worthless. And so this one, when I used to write all the price guides, people say, well, tell me about value. How did, what's what? What are values in a price guide? Values in a price guide are very are very interesting because the way you pick a value that goes in a price guide, a printed price guide, is is that the price is what someone a collector is willing to pay for the object if they do not own it. Okay. Yeah. So the collector is an unusual person because that's a higher pair value than someone wants it for reuse. Right? Right. The second thing is there has one, the second one isn't worth as much to him. Now I give you the example. I I used to own a hop, I used to have, had a huge hop on cast collection. And I the first hop on cast hat that I bought, you know, children's hat that said hoppy on it, you know, mm -hmm. paid a half for it, okay. Well, somebody came to me and said, hey, Harry, I have one. I'll sell it to you for 100 bucks." I said, I'll pay you 25 for it. I said, what? You just paid 100 and a half for one. I said, yeah, but now I have one. <laughs> and the next one isn't worth as much to me as the first one was, right? Right. Exactly. So that, that brings you right to the theory that it's possible to, to flood a market. Yes, of course, eBay proved that, right? which goes to show that we can spend more time talking about the most, just, no, all these topics are important. Important, and, and as we found out that we have this poor other object that we're not gonna to get to tonight, 
But it was fun talking about this stuff, and we will do this again next Wednesday. That's right. We hope, to, we hope first of all, to hear from some of you uh, that have objects you'd like us to talk about by sending an email to community at worthpoint.com, community at worthpoint.com. And if you'd like to comment, oh, oh there it is, community yep. at worthpoint.com. Um, you know, be specific, send as much information as you can, how you got it, what you pay for it, background, anything like that, plus some good JPEG photos. And we'll talk about it here on the air. We, we give special preference to the ones that come in here at a Worth Point community at worthpoint.com. And then if you also remember my projects and want to write to me about what do you think or have that your kids don't want, Harry L. Rinker, H-A-R-R-Y-L-R-I-N-K-E-R, -R -R -E Harry L. Rinker. At AOL.com. So that's it for this session of Worthy Question. So next week, will we find you still in Florida? Oh, yes, we will, because the candidates, which were supposed to show up on Monday, that is Monday, June the 12th, on Tuesday, June the 20th and will not be installed until Wednesday the 21st. <laughs> okay. And the tops, the tops, the courts, tops, the new court stops for the cabinets cannot be ordered until the case. They won't measure them up in advance because there's no room for adjustment when they get here. That's right. So has to come over and measure everything, which means that it takes them another six to ten days to cut them. So one of these days you'll see me waving a flag because Harry thinks he's going to be here through the 4th of July. <laughs> it's nice of All you right. to be able to find humor in this, I might add. I do not. <sighs> well, but you, but, have, you have to have known going into a remote yeah, project take you a while. The, no, no, in the good news department. And as a tribute to Lowe's, my wife and I went over and ordered the new kitchen appliances. Refrigerator, stove, microwave, and dishwasher, right? And they were due for delivery today. And then you get this magnificent call the night before that says, oh, they'll be there sometime between 1230 and 430. And by the way, we can't change that time, and don't you call and ask us to. Goodbye. <laughs> well, he made it by 2.15. So oh, where he is, yeah. I, have, I have a kitchen with the ceiling and the walls done and everything ready to go for the cabinets, except for painting, which is going to get done Saturday. And in the midst of this open space stands one's refrigerator, one hooked up stove and a microwave on a card table and a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we'll, we'll look forward to the update next week. Uh, next week I should look a little healthier by, because I'll be eating better now that I can go out and have a nice meal at night, bring the other half home and eat it the next day by cooking it up in the microwave. Of course, of course, there is a problem. All the dishes are packed away. And the only running water I have is in a is in a sink in the bathroom, the guest bathroom. Yeah, well, so, that makes it a little uh, difficult. And, and paper plates are tough to microwave. Also, and, you know what? I I was surprised. I thought I could find microwavable paper plates or microwavable some kind of plates, and I have yeah. Any plates. I don't know. Okay. I don't know either, except that I should be eating better and maybe being in a better mood. <laughs> you won't be grumpy about, about tennis shoes collecting, sneakers? You're just always going to be well, against I, that. I, I can't use for you. I luxury handbags. I'm not going to start collecting sneakers either. Actually, I got to tell you, the best thing in Florida is I took my shoes off and I have a pair of sandals and I've been in sandals for two weeks. <laughs> Excellent. You know, I got rid of my I got, I got rid of my suits and jackets, pretty much so I called it quits. But I'm looking forward to the day I can get rid of my sh my socks and my shoes. 
and just, you know, and revert back to the early ways of mankind. Right. Well, if you're going to be wearing those sandals, get rid of the socks. Yes. Well, <laughs> actually, that's what my wife says, too, because she hates it when I wear socks with some of my sandals. But what can we yeah. say? All right, sir. <laughs> Enough of all of that. All right, Harry. We'll see you next time. You keep this thing going. So good night. All right. Good night.